and stories. And in this series, we've discovered all the ways that we can unlock Christ's resurrecting power in our lives today. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, we talked about fear and how it can keep us locked away from all the good things that God has for us. After Jesus was crucified, the disciples were literally and figuratively locked in the upper room in Jerusalem, terrified of what was behind those locked doors. But in the midst of their fear and insecurity, Jesus walks in and brings them peace from the Holy Spirit. And as disciples of Jesus, we don't have to pretend fear doesn't exist. It is very real and very legitimate at times. Our challenge, though, is not to allow fear to become all-consuming and debilitating. Instead, as followers of Jesus, we are tasked with living alongside fear with courage and trust in the Lord. And in addition to fear being something that is just inevitable in our lives, so is doubt. When I think of our amazing graduates and all of their hard work, all of the things, all of their studies, their classes and assignments, I think about the times that they have wrestled with doubt and uncertainty in pursuit of truth. I remember all of my graduations from high school, college, and seminary, and in those seasons of intense learning, I experienced a healthy dose of doubt and uncertainty. Moments when I wasn't sure what I believed and if I believed everything that I was being told. Seasons where I explored and deconstructed my faith, which only made me a more mature Christ follower. So I think on graduation Sunday, it is only appropriate to talk about one of my favorite disciples, a man that was always inquiring, always asking good questions, always practicing the art of curiosity, and that is Thomas. While the other disciples were in the locked upper room when the resurrected Jesus appeared, Thomas was not there. And what Thomas chooses to do after this moment that his friends tell them this news makes all the difference in his life and the rest of his faith story. I invite you to turn your attention to the screen as I read John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later... His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I have always loved Thomas, but I have always felt sorry for him for being forever known as the doubter in the group. Peter gets to be known as the rock. James and John get the nickname Sons of Thunder, which sound like a WWE WrestleMania name, if I'm being completely honest. John is forever known as the beloved, but Thomas goes down in history as being infamous for doubting. Oh, doubting Thomas. That's the rep he gets. A disciple that didn't believe. And I just don't think that's fair. Because if I'm honest, I have had my fair share about doubt regarding everything. Faith, politics, systems and structures in our world, society, health, all of it. Doubt is an inevitable part of the human experience, and yet there is such a stigma around it, especially in the church. We are shamed if we're honest about our doubt, and we're judged if we don't believe what other people are telling us to believe. So today, as your pastor, I want to argue that not only is doubt an important part of our faith journey, but it's actually the catalyst that can propel us to being more mature in 
our faith as Christ followers. Whenever I study this passage, whenever I read this passage, I always wonder, where the heck was Thomas when when Jesus appeared to the disciples the first time? Why wasn't he with everyone else? Like, did he draw the short straw and have to go out and get food? Their DoorDash wasn't available then. Did he feel like taking a walk and having a good cry by himself because his best friend and savior had just died? Did he just need some fresh air? I don't know. The truth is we won't know until we get to the heavenly Starbucks and ask Thomas himself. But no matter what the reason for Thomas's absence was, he missed the resurrected Jesus in the upper room, and he missed receiving the peace of the Holy Spirit. And I can only imagine Thomas's face when he walked through the door with whatever, bag of groceries, whatever, and all of his friends are like, Jesus is alive. It's true. He really did conquer death and sin, just as he said he would. As I said to the kids, ultimate FOMO moment. Thomas wanted to see his Savior like all of his friends got to. He wanted to see the disciples get excited because he wanted to witness the scars on his hands. So he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, before anyone goes on to judge Thomas for saying this so so defiantly, I want you to think of all he has endured. Think of the grief he is experiencing. I have had the honor of pastoring individuals and families in the aftermath of some really terrible things. And the thing about grief and trauma in general is that it can blind you to the truth, to the love and the goodness and the hope that is trying to anchor you when you're afraid, when you're unsure. My guess is Thomas's pain was so deep at this moment, he was unable to hear the good news. He was unable to receive the hope that Jesus was alive. But instead of throwing in the towel and leaving Jerusalem like he so easily could have, he doesn't. He engages and he asks for very specific proof. Not to just see Jesus, but to see his scars. I believe Thomas needed to see the scars because for Thomas, the resurrection of Christ was nothing without the suffering of Christ. So the scripture passage tells us that Thomas waits and prays in the upper room for eight days. Eight days is a significant amount of time in the Bible. It explains both divine blessing and commissioning that occur on the eighth day all throughout the Old Testament. The eighth day is a fulfillment of priestly ordination, the day for dedication of infants after they're born, the day of circumcision and the covenant relationship with the Lord, and the day for gratitude and offering. And on the eighth day is the day that the resurrected Jesus again walks through the locked doors, walks through the walls, and appears to Thomas, standing before him with nothing but grace and love, saying, Peace be with you, Thomas. Put your finger here. See the wound at my side. Don't be faithless any longer. I love that Jesus meets Thomas where he's at, in his doubt, in his wrestling, in his struggle, and gives him nothing but love. Shows him the pain and suffering he's endured on the cross for him and for this weary world. And this experience and revelation is what propels Thomas, past doubt, into the world to become an incredible leader for the early church, bringing countless people to come to know the resurrected Savior. You see, this transformational moment in Thomas's life that changed everything all started because Thomas responded with the spirit of curiosity and the healthy dose of doubt. So as we meditate on the story of resurrection, I want to focus on just a few things Thomas can teach us and the class of 2024 in particular. I think the first is that it is okay to go against the grain and disagree with your peers with the people you love, with their community members. As United Methodists, we celebrate logic and reason, and we embrace the importance of critical thinking, which means we don't have to and shouldn't blindly believe whatever we are told. 
We need to research things for ourselves. We need to come to our own conclusions. During my time at Denver Seminary, when I was getting my master's, most of my classmates did not believe it was biblical for me to be there, for women to preach, for women to become pastors. They did not believe there was a place for LGBTQ people in the church. Not only were these two issues I passionately studied because they are so near and dear to my heart, but through my research, my wrestling, my discernment, my study, I received the joy of knowing that God is so much bigger than the box we put him in. Can I get an amen to that? So much bigger. And that all of us have a place at God's table, not just a few. Everyone has a voice. And while I was vocal about my differing opinions with my classmates, and they were vocal about thinking that I was a psycho, we continued to be friends. And some of them have changed their minds too. I think it's important for us to know we can think for ourselves and we don't have to believe something just because everyone around us is telling us to believe it. And I think college, graduate school, those are wonderful places to practice that, that unpacking of what we know. So to my wonderful students who are going off to college, Coral and Parrish, and to Jaden, who's going off to grad school. When you're in class, when you're in a group discussion this fall, when you're studying, I encourage you to practice curiosity and have courage to raise your hand, to question your professors, to dig deeper in finding the truth, because when you do, it will not just deepen your confidence level, but it will also strengthen your faith. The second nugget of wisdom this passage has for us is the reality that belief can be borrowed. Thomas's beliefs were shattered when Jesus died on the cross. Thomas had expectations that Jesus was going to be an earthly Messiah that was going to come in and chuck Norris the place and save the Jewish people in a very political way. But that is not what happened. And that was not the point of Jesus coming to earth. It was all for a much bigger eternal reason. So when Thomas was the only one in his community to have not seen the resurrected Jesus, he was honest about his thoughts and feelings. He was honest about his doubt. And during those eight days of waiting for Jesus to show up, not sure if he would, I believe the other disciples demonstrated the importance of communal belief. Because loved ones, belief is personal, yes, but it is also communal. Even though Thomas couldn't believe resurrection could possibly come after death, his friends did. And their belief was enough to keep them all going through that difficult time. When I think about all of my various graduations, I think about the expectations I had for my life during those moments of celebration and transition. At high school graduation, I was certain I was going to move to California and spend the rest of my life there. That didn't happen. At my graduation from seminary, I was sure I would get easily ordained, find a husband super quick, and we'd have lots of kids. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? Wrong. Took a mountain of hard work, sweat, and tears for seven years to get ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church. I had to endure a lot of horrible first dates and the horrors of online dating, which is for another story, before I met my wonderful husband, Russ. And our journey to having kids has been anything but easy. What I have learned in my almost 36 years of life is that life is hardly ever what we anticipate it being. It is so beautiful and also so, so hard. It is wonderful and full of excitement and it is also absolutely heartbreaking. And in the many seasons of life, where things have not gone according to my plans. I've doubted. I've struggled with my faith. I've questioned where God is. And it was in those seasons that I came to understand and experience the importance of Christian community. Because even when I couldn't see how God was going to possibly redeem the brokenness of my story, the people in my life could. Every time. And they believed it enough for me. Even though I have struggled over and over to believe in the power of the resurrection, the community of believers surrounding me always have. And their belief has gotten me through. 
Their belief was something I borrowed until I could believe it for myself. Belief can be borrowed. The third lesson Thomas teaches us in this story is the importance of sticking around. Blessed are those who stick around, even when they don't understand what the heck is going on. I imagine Thomas woke up every day that week in the upper room, waiting for Jesus to walk through those locked doors. And every day that he didn't come, it was harder to hold on to hope. But he didn't leave. He didn't go back to Galilee, back to his old life before Jesus called him. He stayed. He continued to lean in. And yeah, he was mad and frustrated and angry, but he engaged, pondering the possibility that resurrection could be real. You see, I don't think the enemy of faith is doubt. I think it's apathy. I think it's apathy. Thomas wanted to have an experience with the resurrected Christ, so he pursued one, and he continued to show up waiting for the miracle. One of the saddest things about being a pastor is witnessing people experience deep disappointment from God, and instead of continuing to engage in authenticity with anger and questions and doubt and conversation, they become apathetic. They disengage completely and turn away from the church, from God, from me. I think one of the most courageous things we can do in our journey is to be honest with our struggles, but stick around anyway, to keep coming to church, to keep hearing the good news of Jesus, to keep spending time with believers that love us and pray for us to experience resurrection, even when we haven't experienced it for ourselves. I have this amazing former student who graduated several, several years ago, it's been a while, who struggled all throughout undergrad in their faith journey. They took some world religion classes and some philosophy courses and learned all kinds of things that challenged the beliefs that they had growing up. But as they processed this information, they struggled with what they believed. They continued to engage in their faith. They continued to show up, even in their doubt. And they did that by watching my sermons online, by calling me and asking me questions about Jesus, by texting me and seeing if we could meet for coffee when they were home from school. And what they shared is that it was so important for them to deconstruct their faith because it allowed them to come to a deeper, more mature knowing of who Jesus really is for them. Not for who their parents believe Jesus to be, not for what I believe Jesus to be, but for who Jesus is to them. Someone who's helped me understand the importance of healthy curiosity and doubt is a woman named Rachel Held Evans. Rachel is a theologian and an author who wrote many books that have helped me tremendously have the courage to ask hard questions and maybe admit that the church has gotten some things wrong and we don't know everything. Here's a clip. says that doubt is the ants in the pants of faith, <laughs> and I have found that to be true. Uh, doubt is, is sort of the mechanism by which faith evolves. It's, doubt is how, how you cultivate that posture of having an open hand. Um, doubt is what tells you that maybe this thing that you think is fundamental, that's non-negotiable, maybe it is. Maybe geocentrism is not central to the Christian faith. Maybe a young earth is not central to the Christian faith. So I'm grateful for doubt in my life because it, it has taught me that I can get, get some stuff wrong. I can be wrong, even in matters of faith. It's made me more humble, more dependent on Christ. Um, so I'm grateful for doubt. It keeps, faith, it keeps my faith alive and thinking and um, where certainty sort of just freezes it, you know? Um, so... Yeah, I think, I think doubt plays an important role in faith. I don't think it's the opposite of faith. I think it um, keeps faith awake, alive, thinking, movable, changeable. I just want to be yielded. I really do. I want, even as I've, I've changed and I've, I have new convictions 
um, I want to stay open to the fact that I get stuff wrong, that the church has gotten stuff wrong in the past, and I, I want to have a tender, yielded heart that can change when I'm wrong. And I don't see how else to do that unless I have a healthy place for doubt, a second thought in my life. It makes faith a little more challenging. <laughs> it makes it a little harder sometimes, but I've found that it makes it more real. Well, I'm not willing, I've heard from so many pastors who have told me, if you just take your emotions out of it, if you just take your intellectual struggles out of your faith, then you'll be a better obedient Christian. I'm just, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to be a robot as I, in, on this journey. I want to follow Jesus with my head and my heart fully engaged, alive, awake. That's a bigger risk. It's a bigger risk to stay engaged, but I'm not willing to be a Christian any other way. I don't know how to be a Christian any other way. And I don't think Jesus called me to be a Christian any other way. And it's true, because when we practice unlocking curiosity and digging deeper in our faith, everything changes. So to the class of 2024 and to all of you, beloved church family, my prayer for you is that you would desire to see more, experience more, and encounter more of the resurrected Jesus in your everyday life, that you would be honest with your struggles and faith, but to stick around anyway, even when you don't understand and that your efforts of questioning, engaging, and doubt would lead all of you to an encounter with the real, risen Savior. Amen.